Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is what me and my group are working on at UC Santa Cruz. And this work involves building and understanding distributed data management systems. And we pay special attention to databases on clouds environments. And this interest of ours led us to think and ask the question of the future of the cloud. This is an important question because if we understand what is the future of the cloud, we will know what are the real challenges that we need to tackle today. Um, and a good step to try to predict the future is to understand the present. So I ask, why is the cloud so successful in um, enabling all these emerging applications that we see today? And of course, the cloud has all these nice features that we all know about. But what I really think that it boils down to is that it enables us to process more data. This ability to process more data in a shorter amount of time is what enabled web search to search through hundreds of terabytes of data in only milliseconds. It also what enabled online social networks to connect billions of people. And this is not really unique to the cloud. As some famous technologists have observed, like Ray Kurzweil and Kevin Kelly, despite their more controversial um, ideas, they correctly observed that it seems that technology wants to process more data. So this graph here, for example, shows how the advancements in technology are characterized by this need to process more. And we might expect that this is going to continue. This was the reason why the cloud was successful, why we needed the cloud to be able to process more data. And if we want to understand where the cloud is going, it might be following the same pattern. But what is interesting here is that the technologies that allowed us to process more are changing. And if we just focus in the last 50 and 60 years in computing, and we, we observe the computing paradigms, we see that from mainframes to network machines all the way to the cloud now, there, there are two forces in play. There is a force of consolidation and a force of distribution. Consolidation allows us to put things together. It allows us to utilize resources more efficiently. But at the same time, consolidation sometimes might be limited. And we go for the other force, which is the force of distribution, so that we can be closer to users and overcome some of the limitations of consolidation. And what I want to ask right now is whether we are now at a turning point, whether now we are moving from this consolidated phase, which is the cloud, into one that is more distributed. And what, um, and what we are thinking about in this case is that we are reaching into the limits of what the cloud can give us. Um, there are data transfer costs, because I'm putting everything in the cloud, this means that everything that needs to happen for the application, every request, needs to go to the data center, to this large-scale data center. And also, we have a limit on the um, speed of flight, right? No matter how good your technology is, how, no matter how good your communication is, you're always going to be limited by these seconds of communication that it takes to go to the data center. And of course, I'm not going to go in details, but we've heard a lot about all the privacy concerns that arise when we hand all our data and all the control on our data to these centralized locations and centralized entities. So I think that we are now in a turning point. And like all turning points before, this turning point doesn't happen out of a sudden. It's not one quick shift, but rather it's a slow migration from one force, from the force of consolidation, to the other force, force, which is the force of distribution. And now we're seeing that more and more data management systems are trying to do more closer to users. And this takes mainly two forms. There is a form of trying to distribute the, distribute the applications, distribute the data across multiple data centers, things like uh, Cloud Spanner, like CockroachDB, and others. But there is also another way, which is trying to get close to the actual end user. Um, so things like Firebase, PouchDB, they're trying to utilize the resources that are 
um, um, at the end user, things like mobile phones and browsers. So we are heading there. And what I claim to be the case is that now we are marching into this distributed, uh, distributed phase in computing that I would call global edge data management. And what I think about this case is that in global edge data management, of course, there's not going to be edge nodes in the ocean, but it seems that it's a little bit shifted here. Um, but what we'll have is that all these resources, the compute and storage resources, are going to be distributed all over the world, um, whether it's in data centers or in edge locations that are closer to the users. And the goal of systems that are going to run on this environment are to enable utilizing all these resources around the world. But also it needs to be able to be aware of the asymmetry between these different resources, whether it's in a data center or whether it's in a less expensive edge device. And also it needs to enable these edge-to-edge -edge communication. I no longer want to be limited by hubs of communication that are going to do everything to me. And this is what we're trying to do back in Edge Lab at UC Santa Cruz, where we're trying to um, understand the real challenges of this new environment, of this new computing paradigm, by building a research prototype of a database that we call WedgeDB. That stands for Wide Area Edge DB. Um, and we're currently in the, um, um, in the phase of um, um, writing this prototype. We're hoping to get something out by early next year. But what this is helping us to do is that now we understand the different research directions that are entailed in building these new databases. And this involves many questions about how do we do distributed coordination and consensus in this new environment with a large number of nodes that are far away from each other, and also some other questions about trust. If I'm now relying on more ed edge devices and more end nodes, maybe I don't trust these devices, so maybe I, ha I need to have a, a more stringent fault tolerance requirement, something like a Byzantine agreement requirement. And also we're dealing with some issues about distributed indexing. When we're dealing with all these small devices, distributed indexing can also be uh, more challenging. And we've uh, published recently a couple of papers on these challenges. One is Dynamic Paxos that was published last year in Sigmod, where we've asked the question, if we wanted to reach consensus and agreement across all these devices around the world, how can we adopt, adapt the Paxos protocol or some similar protocols to be, to be efficient, even with these two challenges of a large number of nodes and wide area communication between them? And dynamic Paxos allow you to have more efficiency and high performance in such an environment by allowing much smaller quorums. Um, and the main problem with having small quorums is that it complicates your design. How do I ensure that they don't conflict with each other? And our main innovation to allow these small quorums is to allow these quorums to be dynamically changing, expanding when necessary, and staying small when possible. The other piece of work that we published recently is block plane that was published last month in ICDE. And the main idea of block plane is that even if we reach agreement and consensus across a large number of devices, some of these devices might be Byzantine, might be potentially malicious. So how can I retain the nice features of dynamic Paxos while enabling the, uh, tolerating these malicious activities? And we're building upon some um, um, uh, wide known um, BFT algorithms, and we observe that these can be very expensive because they involve a lot of communication. And when we're doing this communication across the wide area, this can be very expensive. And what block plane does is that it tries to perform this coordination and communication in a hierarchical way where I can where I want to um, leverage locality as much as possible. So this work is led by many wonderful students. Um, to your left, you'll see some bachelor's and master's students who are leading the work on WedgeDB and the development of WedgeDB. Many of them are graduating, by the way, so if you're looking for very smart uh, bachelor's students, uh, please talk to me. 
And also there are uh, three PhD students who are here today. They're going to be presenting posters at the end of the day. So please find them if you're interested about WedgeDB, about global edge data management, and they'll tell you more about it. And of course, it's not only me at UC Santa Cruz who's doing interesting database research. Of course, we heard about all the wonderful research that Peter Alvaro and his group are doing. Uh, but also there is uh, the group of Okuyo and Kulaitis who unfortunately couldn't make it here today. And uh, he is uh, doing a lot of work in knowledge refinement, uh, query evaluation, and query answering. And some of his students are here today, so if you're interested in learning about these works, please feel free to uh, look for them. Um, Carlos Malsan, who is actually here today, um, also leads a group with uh, different lines of work. One line of work is on programmable storage systems where, the, uh, where they explore different opportunities in taking existing code bases and trying to break, break them down, deconstructing them into composable units. And then taking these units and composing them into um, actual systems. So Skyhook is one example of doing this exercise. And they have other um, um, uh, work and systems that take these basic components and trying to get them together into one bigger whole. Um, another line of work that Carlos Maltzhan um, um, is leading is in the pract uh, practical reproducible evaluation of computer systems where they're trying to study the life cycle of system development uh, with the goal of making this more efficient and easier for system developers. Um, Carlos is also leading the CROSS Center, which is the Center for Research in Open Source Software, which is a great place that takes research prototypes and research works from labs or otherwise and try to develop them, provide the environment for them to be successful open source software. There is a lot of um, um, success stories there that I know he will be happy to tell you about if you find him later today. Um, I think I'm missing this slide, but the last group that I want to mention is the group of Lisa Gitour, um, who also couldn't make it today, but they're doing a lot of uh, uh, interesting work. Of course, one of, at least one of her students is here, so if you want to learn more about her work, about her recent work, um, he'll be happy, of course, to tell you more about it. Uh, Lisa is also um, leading the Data Science Center at UC Santa Cruz, which is trying to find collaboration opportunities between companies in the Bay Area and, <clears throat> and research groups at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and lastly, next week, actually, she is organizing the Data Science Day at UC Santa Cruz. I believe that the last day to register for that, uh, for that event is tomorrow. So if you're interested in learning more about data science research in UC Santa Cruz, please consider um, registering for that event. All right, thank you so much. I'll be around here the rest of the day. We'll be happy to talk more about what I, what I presented. <laughs>